The MMA Discussion Podcast is brought to you by sportsofanarchy.com. Visit our site for all your sporting news and needs. We're also brought to you by submissionfc.com. Enter the promo code SPORTSOFANARCHY10 for 10% off the best Brazilian jiu-jitsu gear. We're also brought to you by the Flex Belt. Summer is approaching fast, and if you want to strengthen and tone your abs, the Flex Belt, which is FDA cleared, might just be for you. Follow the link in the description below to get your very own. The MMA Discussion Podcast is now available to listen to on iTunes, the radio uh, podcast app Stitcher, SoundCloud, all available for free on all smartphone devices. And uh, we also want to give a shout out to SoundCloud. Thank you for the uh, the hookup. Basically, I gotta give them a shout out. Thirty sixth episode of the MMA Discussion Podcast. I am joined here with a very special guest, Sal Almeida, World Series of Fighting fighter, also former Bellator fighter. Um, we're glad to have you on, Sal. How you doing? Good. Thanks for having me on. Former World Series of Fighting fighter. <laughs> oh, what's up with that? Yeah. I need to know about that. What's going on? What's going on with you? I know your latest fight. You had one World Series of Fighting fight. After that, um, you went in the dark, and we'd love to know what's going on with you. No, I mean, nothing against him. I'd still fight for them if the opportunity arises, but it was a one-fight deal, so technically, you know, I'm a free agent. Uh, so, you know. So Interesting. I am not opposed to fight for them. But as of right now, I don't have any organization that, I, that I'm tied to, you know what I mean? Got gotcha. you. Yeah. Well, I do. I, I remember seeing an interview you did prior to the fight. You were hoping that with your victory um, over Chris Foster at World Series of Fighting 20, that you were hoping to catch the eye of uh, the UFC. I know that you're definitely interested in getting, uh, making your way over there. Um, is that what you're hoping for coming up next, getting an opportunity to fight there? Yeah, you know that's that's always been the goal, and I was hoping with the victory, maybe we can. You know, be on a good five fight uh, win streak and everything going well. Uh, doing what I did, it was I was able to meet a lot of people and you know get to know a lot of people. So I figured that that's a a way that you know might catch some people's eyes. So pretty much all I had to do was uh, win this fight and you know stay on track. So I was able to do that, and you know we'll see what happens, but. Um, talking to some people, so we just gotta wait and see what happens now. So you're just sitting, waiting it out. If uh, if too much time goes by and World Series of Fighting offers you a fight, will you take the fight? I would. If it's the the reason I took this one was at Foxwoods. It was pretty close to me. I could bring a lot of people down there, and mm -hmm. the the opponent was somebody I wanted. I've been looking at. So yeah, I mean, if the opportunity comes and it's close and there's nothing going on. I'll definitely take it, just as I would take uh, Bellator. Where have you um, primarily been training these days? I mean, I have you here at, uh, you know, I know you train at um, out there in the East Coast of Massachusetts. I was wondering where exactly do you train at? Uh, Carlos Nato, BJJ, and my MMA coach. Uh, I have a couple, but right now I'm still seeing what I'm going to do from now on, but the my brother... Uh, Samuel, he's the one that's been with me for all my fights, so he was with me on this fight, and right now I'm still looking to see where I'm going to go, because I've trained before at American Top Team in Florida, and Black House MMA in LA, so I'm looking uh, to maybe go to LA and get some training down there, also because my manager is Ed Torres, so oh, you know wow. we have the, that contact, but... As of the moment right here, uh, right now in Boston, there's not like a, a, a real team, uh, MMA team that I train. I just say uh, it's a BJJ school and there's some MMA, but you know, nothing that like at the level that I need is just not available right now. So I'm still seeing what I'm going to do. Got you. Um, I wanted to ask you, uh, you know, get a little bit into your background. I was going to ask, you know, you train, you started training karate and jujitsu and wrestling and boxing all at a young age. I mean, did you know from that young age that this might be something you want to do when you got older? Uh, I mean, it's something that just, it kind of, it, it went with it. Like, I started at age eight doing karate and doing a lot of competitions. Then jujitsu, you know, I wrestled in high school. So when I first saw it in like UFC and fighting, I knew it was something that was going to translate well and that I was going to be able to do and so I wanted to do because I, I love being in love, uh, mixed martial arts and everything about it. So I knew eventually when I turned 18 and I could do it. 
it was just going to be an easy transition. So, yeah, from from a young age, I knew this was what I was going to do. That's um, interesting. In your last fight, you know, it was very competitive, very close fight. Um, you know, uh, uh, looking at the judges' scorecards that um, – or not judges' scorecards. I looked at all media scorecards. Um, by the end of that fight, did you feel you had won? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and the judge that scored against me was none other than Doug Crosby. You've heard about him. Right? Oh, yeah. We've been hearing stories. He actually yeah. did a appearance on Chell Sonnen's podcast and just made an ass out of himself. So. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I had no doubt that I had won the fight. Mm-hmm. But the thing with this fight is – I, I this is a fight that I wanted and I thought stylistically w- would be good for me. Mm-hmm. But you know, to be honest, I I didn't really train any MMA training for this fight, like not at all. Like a month out from the fight, I hadn't done like one sparring with MMA gloves or any like grappling with MMA gloves. It was strictly conditioning to stay in shape and dieting to cut the weight. That was mostly what I was doing. And with the world tour, yeah, I did train here and there with Aldo and his and his coach. They helped me. Mm-hmm. But there was really no MMA training for this fight. So I kind of took a risk and relied on just the talent that I had and the knowledge that I had for all these years of training. But, you know, that's that's a risk I took, and that's why the the fight was a little bit closer than it should have been. You know, I should have mm-hmm. made it look easier than, than it did, and I should have finished him either by submission or ground and pound or whatever by the first or second round. So... A lot of people see that and they just think, oh, that was a, it was a, it might have been a bad performance, a bad fight, or whatever they think. They're going to criticize. But, you know, they don't know what's going on. So it is what it is, and at the end of the day, it's a win. My, my assessment, particularly in the fight, was that you actually remained in great condition and uh, all the way for the straight 15 rounds. So what training you did do ended up paying off, I feel. I think that you were able to out-condition him throughout the rest of the fight. And I did have you winning um, that on the judges' scorecards. It was just a very close fight, and uh, I've had a lot of debate with uh, especially some of the uh, the uh, the other admins here over at the MMA discussion team. Um, but a, well, a great performance, in my opinion. And, uh, you know, yeah, you won five straight. Um, you know, uh, you, you seem very busy, generally. You fight a lot. And, uh, I like to stay active. I'm sorry? I like to stay active and always keep fighting. I'm I'm not the person to fight one two times a year. Yeah, for to, to get it's definitely a, a a good setting right now to have over 20 fights with only with, with uh over the span of seven uh, years, and um, you know definitely the UFC could use somebody like that for sure or Bellator. You know you've uh, certainly shown that you're a high level fighter. Um, and I wanted to also ask you, you know. What what is it you you uh you took to more so growing up? Was it karate or jujitsu or wrestling or boxing? What did you take more uh, liking to growing up? Uh, I think it was karate. I've always liked like striking and stand up. Mm-hmm. I mean, by the looks of my last fight, you, you, a lot of people probably would wouldn't look at it like that. But striking is something I've probably been enjoying more. And I started with karate, then I did jujitsu, but. I took, I started doing boxing when I was 16. I've had some pro boxing fights, never went amateur. And, you know, uh, mostly some of them I did it, you know, for the money, just because of the competitive. But I, I took on like guys that were like 10 and 0 and like the, the number one guys in the, in the region. And I took them to like the distance and one, you know, there was one fight, it was six rounders. I won two rounds out of the guy and they were like surprised and stuff. So, you know, striking is something that I've always liked. So I'm not uncomfortable anywhere in a fight. I like doing everything pretty much. Being that um, Ed Soares is your manager, have you ever thought of possibly competing at, at his promotion at RFA? Uh, yeah, we actually talked about it. Uh, one opponent that uh, kind of came up was Sam Toomer. He just fought uh, Justin Lawrence and for the title. Oh, yeah, yeah, I saw so that fight. Before the fight, we actually talked about him as a possible opponent. So yeah, th- that's definitely a possibility. Um, you fought for Bellator before, but for each of those fights, were they also those kind of one one off fights where they were just one contract signed or? Uh, the first one was where I beat Tataki Matsuda, who's in the UFC now. Mm-hmm. Uh, the following one we did a three fight deal, and that ended on last February when I fought Andrew Fisher from the UK. That was my last one. 
Um, what what is They've it? They've been good to me. I'm sorry. Bellator has always been good to me. That's cool. Yeah, I was about to ask, like, um, you know, what, what, uh, like, how is your treatment there at Bellator? A lot of people always ask, uh, and so I feel like it's it's necessary to ask. You know, how how do they treat the fighters there? I mean, how do you feel like you were treated there and everything? Yeah, no, it was uh, definitely. You know, I, I had no complaints. I've always uh, dealt with Sam Kaplan, who's not with them anymore. You know, he's always treated me fairly. Always, you know, gave me the fights I wanted and meaning like gave me fights when they came around here to Mohegan Sun. So he always put me on the card and so uh, they were actually going to give me a fight that I wanted to against Kurt Pellegrino, but that ended up falling out. He ended up getting injured uh -huh. and you know what happened there. But so yeah, no complaints about them. World Series of fighting. Everything has been good so far. Moving forward, I mean, uh, it wouldn't be fair for uh, the fans that have asked me to ask. I mean, uh, what, talk about your time with the the world tour with uh, Aldo. I mean, uh, we, we got a lot of gist of uh, of him from the uh, embedded series and you know how he's acting. But like, talk about his demeanor throughout all of that because it, it certainly felt like he was getting an unfair run uh, throughout that world tour because of all the hype surrounding Connor. But you know, how how was he um, in basically keeping composed under all that? Uh, stress and pressure from everybody to promote the fight. It was uh, it was pretty relaxed throughout the the tour. Obviously, there were some tense situations where Connor would you know be close to him and you know touch him at once, and he would feel like disrespected and stuff like that. But besides like the press conference where there was tension and you know a lot of people yelling at him. Other than that, aside, we were, you know, when there wasn't, like, anything about a fighting, we were joking around, we were being friendly, talking to each other, like, just trying to distance from what was going on. But, yeah, it was definitely a, a tiring tour. You know, there was, we, we didn't keep up with time or, like, the day. We just, it was moment by moment. And, you know, it was, it was a pretty cool thing. He, uh... He got, you know, he stayed respectful. He's a, he's a, he's a champ. He doesn't let that, that stuff get to him. But, you know, some things, like Connor said, you know, there's just no way you can't, like, block it out. So, obviously, you saw that at the, at the Dublin press conference. You know, he got a little agitated and started saying, you know, something back at the, at the stare down. He was yelling in Portuguese mostly, but, you know, it was some pretty hard stuff. So, he definitely kind of butted heads a little bit at the end. Mm -hmm. But you know that's you know it's gonna promote the fight. It's gonna it's gonna sell. But a lot of people saying it's it's all hype. It's all fake. It's definitely not fake. Like even when the cameras weren't around, and Connor used to pass by the hallways and stuff, he used to like look at Aldo and Aldo used to stand up. So you can see that it's it's real. You know Connor's crazy. He's gonna do what he what he does. But you know Aldo just keeps his his cool and. You know, just looks at at another fight. From from our um, you know, from our point of view, it seemed, of course, that he did say compose. And was there ever a time though where you know Aldo kind of got exasperatingly angry? Um, when they did a Good Morning Canada, and Aldo sat down, so Connor went behind and took advantage and and kind of. Put his hands on Aldo. Oh, uh, yeah, the hand on the shoulder deal. Yeah, that was a moment that Aldo really wanted to do something, but, you know, you, you know you can't at that moment. It was like 10 seconds before going live. Yeah. So, you know, Connor knew that, and he took advantage of that. It was something that he wouldn't do face-to-face, -face, but, yeah, that was probably the, the moment where, you know, he wanted to do something, like, out of the whole tour, mm -hmm. like, you know, the, the most. But, you know, obviously... He, he kept it. He kept his composure, and, you know, didn't do anything. But you know, that's that's the the kind of champion he is, and he'll show that. Gotcha. Well, we appreciate the questions, man. We actually have uh, some fan questions after we announced that you'd be coming on the show. Are you down to do some of those? Yeah, anytime. Cool. Um, we'll go with the Twitter ones first, or quicker. Yeah. And by the way, when I said I'd I'd want to slap Connor. And a lot of people are saying, oh, try that. See what will happen to you. Uh, <laughs> I'd, I'd still do it. Uh, <laughs> I hear you, man. I mean, last thing here is that, you know, um, 
and I think it'd be very uh, um, what's the word? I guess it'd be fair to break down that fight with you on on the podcast. You being a you know, a, um, I guess often training partner of, of Jose. Would would that be would I be correct in saying that? Do you train with him every now and again? Uh, yeah, and I plan to uh, train with him. Uh, some probably may or June go down there. So yeah. Oh cool. uh, yeah, I mean, I just uh, you know my breakdown of the fight. I'll, I'll say it right now is that you know I believe that um, Connor has a very interesting striking style. He's got this very awkward old school European uh, boxing style, but it's it was used by guys that generally had shorter arms. You know, it's called like in a in a it was basically called shifting back in the day. Um, as opposed to what shifting is now it's uh his is very old school but he also utilizes kicks and you know it's a very interesting style that barely anybody in mma that i know uses it but um jose aldo's striking style is very unique in that it actually has a lot of weapons that can expose his very wide open uh stance and footwork and um with that, if if we're going based strictly off striking, I, I have Aldo winning that. You know, he's got the faster hands as well. He's got leg kicks that could really, you know, break the wide open stance of of Connor. And so, you know, if I had to uh, assess it just like that on striking, which I feel like most of this fight will take place, um, I feel like Aldo probably wins. Um, would you be? Uh, what about you? What do you think happens in that fight? Uh, Despite your bias, I just want to hear. Yeah. No. I'm, I mean. Connor has a really good style to give a lot of people problems. So, mm -hmm. not being biased, like he, I think he will present a couple problems. But the thing is, from what I've seen, Aldo's gonna have counters for Al for McGregor's like the stuff that he does best. I think Aldo's gonna have counters for that, mm -hmm. and I think that's what's gonna be the what what Connor's gonna have the most difficulty like dealing with is gonna be the the counters. So not going in it too much. I, I just I think it's gonna be a, a close fight for a little bit, but at the end I I'm, I see Aldo winning. Same and more so just because you know I think that as far as uh, the longer the fight goes, I think uh, Aldo uh, has somewhat of an advantage so long as he's able to keep his tank in check. Um, but yeah, I do believe it'll be a very exciting fight. You know, Connor presents a striking style that very few possess and that'll certainly be hard to you know crack uh, as far as the puzzle the puzzle of his striking goes but i believe that also has a tool so yeah i kind of see him winning that fight too um, yeah. i'm just seeing him train like he's just he's an animal like his kicks are extremely hard he's super fast oh they look like it yeah it's it's uh, i was like blown away <laughs> and with yeah. all the you know with all the intensity of of uh of promoting this fight that's gone on thus far it should definitely be uh exciting uh fight to watch yeah, um, yeah let's get back to you let's get on these fan questions um we got a guy it's halfrey <laughs> if i said that wrong i'm sorry um so ask um if you come into the ufc is there any particular opponent that you want to fight coming in um let's see no not, nobody comes to mind but definitely, you know, some 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 good guys that will be like exciting fights. But no, nobody comes to mind. But I don't want to be fighting a lot. Like if if I do come in and I don't want to be fighting a lot, like outside the top fifteen, like say three, four fights. It'll be like one, two fights, and then start moving in. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um. Stacy C T asks, um, "Have you ever fought, or have you ever ha uh, had the desire to want to fight outside of the U.S.? Um, you're Brazilian, and you haven't fought in Brazil. Is that ever a dream of yours to do so? And if so, um, which city in particular would you like to? Uh, another country, you mean? Yeah, I, she asked specifically in Brazil, but yeah, uh, her general question was, would you like to fight yeah, outside uh -huh. of the U.S.?" In Brazil, I'd love to fight Belo Horizonte in Minas Gerais. Mm -hmm. That's uh, the UFC has been there a couple of times. That's uh, where I've lived for a while. So that's definitely a, a place I'd love to fight. And another one would be Japan. I'd love to fight in Japan. Oh, Japan's awesome. <laughs> yeah. What was it? Bobby Earden asks, 
when you go um, to train for a fight camp, what do you feel is the hardest thing about any particular uh, part of training? When I go what? He asked. I, I, uh, he didn't ask it correctly, but I feel like his question was, "What is the hardest part about training for you?" Uh, probably the. I mean, I, I love training, so it's like there's nothing that I dislike about it. Obviously, when it gets close to a fight, the uh, you gotta watch your weight. So when it's too close to a fight, maybe you can't focus too much on the. On the training, you gotta focus on the on the weight. So that's something that I don't like leading up, you know. But I, I've been uh, I've been able to manage it pretty well. But it, it still sucks. Like when it's close to the fight, you you're not able to focus on training. You gotta focus on on, on your weight and dieting and stuff like that. But training wise, I love doing everything. Conditioning, like there's nothing that I I dislike. So you know, I'm pretty happy with everything. Um, you compete at, um, uh, moving forward, are you going to be competing at lightweight or featherweight? Featherweight. Featherweight. But I see lightweight in the future. Is that dependent on whether you get signed by the UFC or? No, no, no. In the UFC, it would be featherweight. Featherweight? Yeah. But I'm saying, like, if, if I, if my body starts to grow and I feel like, you know, that I can put on muscle and fight at lightweight, then... That'll be it, but definitely for the for the time being, in the next you know minimum couple of years, will be featherweight. Cool. And real quick, uh, yeah, uh, two guys: Ricardo Lamas and Max Holloway. Two guys I'd love to fight. Obviously not now, but in in the in the future. Those would be excellent I, fights. I don't sure. like, and the other one I think it's a good style matchup for me and an exciting matchup. So there you go. <laughs> um. And then Ricardo Long is the one I don't like. Is it okay if I ask why? I don't know. It's just... <laughs> might be... I don't know. Just Some guys you just... You, you like from the start. Some guys you don't. He's rubbing and the wrong way. He's just... I don't know. Maybe he's here. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> he's got that... that look. Uh, he's got a funny, like... Uh... Mo Fro, Mohawk. I can't even say it's a Mohawk, but whatever it is. Uh, maybe you got it from Vito Bell for a second. <laughs> oh man. Uh, we'll move on to the Facebook questions. We got a um, a Tyson Tyson McElroy. I hope I said that right. Again, if I said it wrong, I'm sorry. He asked, um, should you ever fight at lightweight? Would um, a fight with uh, Diego Sanchez appease you at all? <laughs> Yeah, question, that'll, be, but. that'll be a fun fight. Yeah. All right, and we have a... I actually want to see him fighting uh, one of my friends, Joe Loza. That was supposed to go down. Yeah, that was supposed to go down in the Mexico car last year. So Dude, bummed. But... Yeah, he's actually supposed to come back from his shoulder injury sometime soon. He's had the surgery. He's been out for four months since. Should be coming back soon. But yeah, who wouldn't want to see that fight, you know? You know, but he, I, I feel like he's on the decline, so... Yeah. But obviously, by the time I get there, and if I go to lightweight and he's still fighting, you know, it wouldn't go very well for him. That's how I would feel. Fair enough. But, Have you yeah. trained with uh, Joe Lozon much, being out there in the same similar region? I've never actually got to train with him. But obviously, I know him. He's, you know, he's kind of a friend. I always talk to him, but never actually got to train with him. That's something I want to do, actually. I've always told him. And he's like, a, I think, an hour from me. Well, definitely try to get something going. That'd be yeah, fun. Definitely. He's one of my favorite fighters too, so. Yeah, he's definitely one of the premier fighters of all time that uh, you got to yeah. watch, especially. Um, I lost my track of my question here. Hold on. By the way, uh, good luck to Joe Lozon in his upcoming Metamorphosis matchup. Um, should be very exciting to watch. Coming up soon, I believe. Yeah, I've heard both guys like leg locks and stuff like that so it should be exciting oh, I mean he's the epitome of exciting as, as far as watching anybody grapple or fight so yeah yeah you know 15 or like 13 whatever bonus like he's the leading yeah that should he tell has, you something. yeah he has 14 14 yeah that should tell you something right yeah, there. crazy he has enough to buy like 5 houses with all that just alone <laughs> <laughs> right. 
That's over a half a million, probably. Yeah. No, it is. I believe it's around the. Uh, even if you go by, because there have been performance bonuses back in the day that used to be like seventy-five thousand or even close yeah. to a hundred thousand. So, you know. Yes, yeah, uh, hundred did a hundred thousand for bonuses. Yeah, and uh, you know, I believe the highest one he ever won was eighty thousand from pay per view that he was on. I believe it was. Um, one thirty-six, maybe I think it was against Gallard. That yeah, was his highest crazy. paying out of a, a fight bonus. You pay tax over at those ones? Do you know? I don't believe they do actually. Not with those. That's nice. Yeah, quite the hookup. <laughs> yeah. Um, final question here from what's his name? Martin. Um, Martin Slorowski. <laughs> Um, he asked, um, what has been your favorite part of uh, growing up in the world of MMA? Which style appeases you? I already asked you that. I believe you said karate. But um, he asked, what style uh, appeases you the most? And singularly, do you enjoy wrestling? And if so, uh, who do you train with on your wrestling? Uh, wrestling, I, I do love it. I wrestled in high school. I train with a guy. His name is Justin Dork. Uh, the gym, so he he does the wrestling training. But as of right now, I think what I like the most is boxing. That's what I've been focusing on, and that's probably what I like the most at the moment. But I do like everything. I'm just saying, like right now, it's like every time I spar boxing or I train boxing, I uh, I just like it a little bit more. Just that's something that I've, I've grown to like. And what was the first part again? Oh, what, what, what the first yeah. part of the question? Oh, just like uh, what style pieces you the most to watch alone? And I guess I'll add to that question. Like, is there a certain fighter that, that utilizes that style that you enjoy watching the most? Oh, definitely. Uh, Nick Diaz. Nick Diaz? <laughs> yeah. I love watching him fight. Nick, Nate, uh, Anderson, you know, those guys. Certainly. Yeah, they're very fun to watch. Yeah. Um, that's all the fan questions we got, and I gotta say I appreciate the time that uh, we've had having you on. Um, no problem. No so, hate, nice. No, no criticism. No people hating on me. <laughs> I've gotten a lot, of, a lot of that. Really? Why? So hey, that's part of it, right? I guess, but I mean, like, what well, seriously? Why? What's <laughs> you know? I mean, other than you know, I mean, you're very vocal, and we appreciate that. I actually appreciate having a guest on here that's vocal and says we want. You're not gonna get any criticism on our side at all. We appreciate any, uh, any and all honesty that comes in upon here. And you know, um, being able to talk with somebody about the uh, Aldo Connor fight helps. I can never find anybody smart to talk about that fight. <laughs> yeah. I mean, because I mean, dude, let's be real. I feel like the the uh, the the hype is really doing much of half the fight for him in that people think that just because you know I, I wouldn't say his his string of fights um has shown anything to me that he will be able to beat Aldo in that case you know what I mean and yeah. um you know and that's why and and from what I've seen from Aldo I see that he has the tools to counteract anything that um Connor's been able to do even some of Connor's old opponents have been able to show some weakness in his game so. I mean, if they could, I feel like Aldo can. Yeah, definitely. And even, you know, uh, Connor being a little more unpredictable, mm -hmm. that, uh, that uh, those things that he does that's unpredictable, I do believe Aldo would have counters for that. He's shown me a couple. I'm not gonna say. But I think he's going to be ready for the fight, and he, he'll know what to do. He's going to be a little quicker. It's going to be competitive for a little bit, but then I, I think everything will fall into place. And Aldo is going to start taking over. That's, you know, how I feel it'll go. The first one round, two rounds, it's going to look a little competitive. And then, you know, it's going to shift towards Aldo. And then he's just going to take over from there. I feel you. I think I also speak for uh, one of my other hosts on the show, uh, Jonas, when we both agree with you fair handling on that. <laughs> Everybody yeah. else we talk to, we can't get a fair argument out of them. You know what I mean? But that's a great assessment of it. Um, and again, we appreciate you. Where can people find you on social media? Uh, Twitter at Saul Almeida and Instagram Saul underscore Almeida. Uh, Facebook Saul Almeida. There's a fan page, there's a friend page. Uh, just look me up, same name. Awesome. Well, Talk awesome. to me, whatever. 
I'm done. Awesome. Well, um, Mr. Almeida, we appreciate the time. You've been an amazing guest. We love talking to you. And hopefully we'd love to get you back on here again next time we do. Hopefully you're a UFC fighter by then. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. My favorite inter interview so far. <laughs> we appreciate that, man. And, uh, yeah, again, let us know. Um, uh, if you get a fight lined up, if it's in the UFC, we'd love to have you on here again to talk about that fight. Definitely. we Will do. I got something planned for this weekend, early next week. I can't really talk about it, but. I'll keep you updated. You'll be the first to know. Awesome, dude. We appreciate you, Sal. Almeida, ladies and gentlemen, we appreciate your time, man. And I uh, can't wait to have you on again. You heard his, uh, you heard his spiel. We can't wait to see you. Featherweight, correct? Yep. Uh, it's going to be awesome. All right, Thank you. And that was our special guest, Sal Almeida. I want to thank him again for coming on. Terrific interview. Uh, appreciate having him on. And... I am now joined by my co-host, Chris Pagman. What's up, man? Yeah, what's up? I'm really bummed out that I missed that interview and couldn't join on, but shit happens. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I hear That's you have like a thunderstorm be. going on out there in the East Coast right now, yeah? Yeah, so if anyone... Lucky? <laughs> yeah, that's for you in LA, and not so lucky here because we get too much rain, but if you guys hear some thunder or anything like that, it's me. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's... Good to have you inside, and yeah, as speaking speaking like a true West Coast guy right now. I need some rain. It's so dry out here in California. Uh, well, let's get let's get to topic. We got a lot to talk about. First of all, yeah, we do. first of all, it came out yesterday that Anderson Silva would be uh, officially, you know, he made the official announcement. I guess you could say that he is going to attempt to join the Brazilian Taekwondo Olympic team. Uh, in which case, that's pretty crazy. Um, <laughs> I mean, and he he's going to attempt to join the team. It's not a done deal that he will actually be in the Olympics. He's got to join the team first, which by itself is already one of the toughest things you can ever possibly do. Um, you know, and so I, I will be very interested to see if, like, you know, he does join it. If he doesn't, you know, that'd be wouldn't surprise me. I mean, the, the level of skill it takes to be in that is, is ridiculous. And, uh, um, yeah. and, uh, even though Silva is one of the best MMA fighters of all time, tight, you know, tightening up one specific aspect of, of, of your, uh, of your style, um, is very hard to do, especially when, you know, I, I don't believe that he's done traditional Taekwondo in a long time as far as like training hardcore for it. So for him to want to do it, join the Olympics teams, um, for me, seems very unlikely, but we'll see. I mean, it is Anderson Silva, so I mean, we got to give him respect and see what happens. Yeah, I I tend to agree with you there that it is very unlikely that he'll make the team itself, let alone compete in the Olympics. Um, like you said, I got to agree with everything you said. The the training that goes into that is ridiculous. He's also thirty eight now, thirty nine. Is he older than that now? I'm not even sure. Thirty nine. He turns thirty eight this month. No, no, no. Actually, his birthday. What's today? The no, his he's birthday 40. is forty, dude. He's forty. He's forty. His birthday is um, April fourteenth. This this podcast will be out tomorrow, which is Thursday, the twenty third. His birthday is April fourteenth. Oh, I thought it was twenty fourth. Yeah, no. So he I, just turned forty. He just turned forty. So right. that's gonna factor in to that. He probably realizes that he won't be able to fight MMA for a while, despite the fact that he doesn't think he failed this drug test. So, mm -hmm. I mean, he probably will be out for a while. <clears throat> Obviously, it's tough because we don't know the extent of his Taekwondo background, even though he's probably, I'm assuming, a black belt, even though I could be wrong. Because, I mean, if you're going to go for the Olympics, I'm assuming you're a black belt in Taekwondo. I'm no, not just is, making yeah. the. I'm not just going to make the uh, jiu-jitsu. Uh, assumption. This one actually has some. It has some candor to it. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. I. I don't know. I, <laughs> this is just wild, age, you know. Yeah, at his age and uh, the fact that he probably hasn't trained for this, I, I'm not sure. I don't think he'll make the Olympic team. We'll see. I don't want to make a judgment call on it yeah. yet. But of course, of course, the, I tend to lean towards so, what you're saying, though. You know? Yeah, you have to give him the respect because obviously he's that good. But I, I agree as well. We, I don't, I think it's very unlikely. Mm -hmm. We'll see what happens. Good luck to you, Mr. Silva, Mr. Goat. We'll see. 
I don't know. Moving on. Yeah, not, not much to say about that one. Mm-hmm. Moving on. Quentin Rampage Jackson is back again. again. <laughs> <laughs> this is very interesting. Um, apparently, his uh, his court order injunction got reversed, which I don't understand at all. <laughs> yeah, either do I. I mean, I've done my I've done my due diligence and research on this, but you know, the judge from the Superior Court of New Jersey's uh, Appellate Division overturned Bellator's injunction yes or not yesterday, Tuesday, um, which allows him to compete against Fabio Maldonado at UFC 186 this weekend. Which good for the card, um, Steve uh, Boss. I hope I said that name or Bose. I, <laughs> I think it's Boss. <laughs> boss um, was supposed to fight Fabio in. Um, in a you know in a quick you know turnaround for uh rampage getting taken off the card but we'll receive his show money and hopefully get a fight in the near future i was interested in seeing him fight after i had done some research and on him and got me a little excited to see him fight so hopefully we'll see him fight uh sometime soon but it's good that the, the card gets rampage back especially on short notice like this when people start hearing about it because you know then you start to you know get the gauge of oh wow rampage is back on you know all of a sudden that excitement factor comes back and i like it so for me i mean what, what do you think about this yeah i mean i wasn't really too excited about uh steve boss it, it is pretty cool that he was a minor league enforcer in the nhl and apparently he beat the crap out of some dudes back then, but it's a lot different in MMA. Obviously, he has a proven record of 10-1, and one. and uh, as for Rampage and the whole injunction getting overturned, I really am I'm kind of confused on it, because I haven't really seen too many sources coming out and saying too much about it. Maybe the UFC is greasing some pockets or some wallets there, I don't know. No, I'm just joking about that, but I... Just joking, but... You're trying to get I a shut down, it. son. I don't know exactly how that worked out that Bellator won the injunction and then it gets overturned. I really have no clue. Um, I mean, it helps the card. Yeah. It, it gives a uh, back Maldonado versus rampage. But in my opinion, the card still isn't pay-per-view worthy at this point. It's like we're rampage on the card. It kind of looks like a decent, like a low tier Fox card, I guess, or a decent Fox card. Not much more than that. How dare you? All right. Anyway, uh, I'm you know, I uh, I really want to be able to. I'm always excited to see Demetrius fight. I'm one of the very few, but apparently that makes me in love with this card. <laughs> but I lo I do uh, want to see this card. Luckily, I don't have to pay for it. Considering as you and I were talking about, I had a deal with somebody and I ended up winning it. Oh, nice. Yeah. <laughs> so. With that being said, um, I really am excited to see Rampage come back to the UFC to see how he does. You know, obviously this is his first fight back, so he's he's uh he's getting kind of a I wouldn't say a handout, but you know, cause Fabio Maldonado, you never know if that uh, what that guy could do. I mean, he is a, he's a he's got a very um, un underrated striking game. I mean, that is his bread and butter, and he loves to trade with guys. So regardless, I think it'll be an exciting fight to watch no matter what. So. Um, yeah, and of course, I'm I'm excited to see Demetrius fight. And uh, while we're on the topic, um, you know, I uh, Demetrius Johnson came out and said something out in the media that I thought was very. I mean, he put it better than he 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 spoke on terms that I had been wanting to say for the longest time, you know, and um, and I didn't know how to put it into words. And then he took the he basically took that concept concept and put the words incorrectly. And this is his quote. Quote, of all the sports, this is the only sport where scrutinized where it falls all on the athlete. Why does it always come down to blaming the athlete for not selling the product? Um, and that, that to me just hit me. I was like, wow. I mean, that could not be a more truer statement to me. You know, because, and again, he goes on to say, you know, when I got in this sport, quote, when I got in the sport, I thought all I had to do was beat people and finish fights and everything else would take care of itself. And he's right. You know. Demetrius has done nothing wrong. He's every time he goes in there, he puts out a bomb ass performance. He beats guys. He's dominant. He takes everything to the, um you know to the nth degree when it comes to being a flyweight. He's fast. He's strong. He's athletic. He's technical. He's per nearly perfect at everything. And um, you know, uh, for me, it, it really 
hit me like, yeah, I mean, I never thought about it as we were, you know, scrutinizing the athletes, but I guess we kind of are because of the fact that, you know, NFL is popular because it's everywhere. You can see it and you don't talk mostly about the athletes, you talk about where you'll see the fight, how you'll see the fight, or I mean, how you'll see a game, where you'll see a game, you know, and, uh, you know, it's never on like the, the, the exact player that you're going to watch. I mean, for some people it is, but you know, again, for fighters, it sucks because, you know, it is, you know, for boxing, the most of the fights just sell itself. Boxing sells boxing. But for MMA, it's most of the time it's the fighters that sell MMA. And I mean, I guess in, in a, to, to another um, in another argument, I guess it makes sense because, you know, I mean, it's such a different sport from everything else. But at the same time, I feel like it's still a little unfair when it comes down to, you know, a card like this that has exceptional skill and talent on the card, but because of it also having what a lot of people would say isn't exceptional talent and skill on the card, that comes down to, you know, the the punishment of the card in itself when the fights itself could be arguably some of the best we'll ever see, you know, and... Um, you know, I know that we've had our, our argument about this card being that you know you, you want to you want to compare it to the that of a Fox card or a Fight Night card, but uh, other than that, you know, I've, I I feel like this is perfect um, wording for a problem that I don't think can ever be fixed. But you know, it's just kind of how it is. I mean, what were your thoughts on that quote from Demetrius? I mean, and I somewhat agree with it, but I don't fully agree with it because you have to look at it this way: uh, football, as you used as an example. It's been around forever. It's a team sport. And, I mean, people have their team. They root for a team. That's kind of the point. It doesn't come down to an individual because it's not an individual sport. It's a lot different. Where in MMA and even in boxing, it's an individual sport. You're going out there competing by yourself, and you're not on a team. I mean, yeah, you train with a team, but when you're out there, it's just you. So, of course, when you, when you look at boxing – is the boxing going to market, I don't know, let's say a fight between, I, I'm not even sure, I don't know too many boxers, but I know enough why Miguel Cotto versus Amir Khan. I'm not even sure if they fight in the same weight class, but I know they fight somewhere near, near each other and that could happen. Would they market that more or would they market Floyd versus Pacquiao more? Obviously, they're going to market Floyd versus Pacquiao more because they're both bigger names in the sport and that fight's going to sell a lot more. So, it still is kind of the athlete selling the sport, and boxing has also been around for a very long time. Boxing is an old sport as well. MMA is a newer sport. So when you have a guy like um, Conor McGregor, obviously they're going to market him more. It's the same thing as a Floyd Mayweather or Pacquiao. They're very well, he, he's a guy who's going to be able to sell for you, and that's the same thing in boxing. I mean, it's uh, not to the same extent, but it is the same way. Where guy like Demetrius Johnson, yeah, he finishes fights, but he's not the personality that Connor is, and he's a smaller guy, and a lot of people who aren't big fans of the sport don't tend to care about the smaller guys, so that's all I can really say. Yeah. I, again, particularly, I'm excited for this card. Um, can't wait to see it, and uh, I'm excited for the Saturday. Um, we wanna, before we get down to that, we were going to talk about something else, weren't we? Uh yeah, the ultimate fighter. The ultimate fighter going down tonight our time as for, as per the uh our podcast regulations, but by the time you hear this it will have already passed. In which case, go ahead and comment what you believe uh was the best part of the card and of course on the, on the next Monday's podcast we'll be uh be going over it and talking about it and uh should be interesting. I I really do like the new approach that they're taking with this and taking two fight camps and uh you know making it a Making it a this this team versus this team kind of deal with this coach being the head of this coach and there's like a little rivalry in between. It's something much different than we've seen than uh than from any other Ultimate Fighter show, which I like. You know, this, this is the second new thing that they brought. The last one involved the title fight between two, uh 16 of the top uh fighters in the strawweight division. And now we have a, a team versus team deal, and I like it. I really um. I really do like the approach that the UFC has taken with this, and you know, I, I, I it, depending on the success of it, I wouldn't mind seeing it again. Seeing two teams like uh, uh, one of the most um, popular um, ideas of of another team versus another team is like Team Nova and Yao versus Team Alpha Male. 
It's a very uh, interesting idea. Um, Chris, what do you think about uh, this new style that the the Ultimate Fighter is using, and, and are you going to be watching? Yeah, I'll definitely be watching. I think it's a cool new concept to add to the show. That it, the show became a little stagnant at some point. Points, I think, doing this, especially with teams with rivalries, it ups the level of excitement outside of the fights, which is needed for a TV show. Because you have a lot of MMA fans who really don't care about that. Because like last year, it was a lot of just catty girl stuff that was going on. <laughs> a lot of it was, and that takes up. How oh, dare stuff. you! A lot of the show is taken up by, like I'd say at least half of the show is taken up by what goes on inside the house, the arguments, the drama, whatever. And then the other half is training and fights, which a lot of fight fans are more interested in seeing because they're not really into reality TV. This show, it can actually make for some real drama, which is ex- kind of exciting because, I mean, the obviously the owners of ATT and the Black Sun don't seem to get along. It, we can see how that affects the fighters in the house. And, um... Again, like a Novo Nyao versus uh, Team Alpha Male, that would be really fun. I don't know if it would happen because of the language barrier there, but um, yeah, that could be an interesting one as well. So I'm really looking forward to this. And uh, they got a few really good guys in there, especially um, Steve Carl. I mean, that's a World Series of fighting their first uh, welterweight champion until he lost to Husamar Pajara. So he's probably the big favorite going into this. So I'm excited to see how that goes as well. Husamar Pajara um <laughs> I really hope that you know the the fights live up to potential welterweights and lightweights I enjoy watching them compete very much so it should be interesting um I, re- I I really am most interested though in seeing this rivalry only because I don't get where it comes from you know yeah do so, I so I mean uh should be I have- should be good TV I I definitely will have my DVR set and we'll be watching it once it's yeah. available to us um but yeah i like i said i mean this should be uh, i'm glad that the ufc is taking different approaches to the show trying to keep it alive and uh it, thus far it seems to be doing a good job a lot more people are excited for this season than i've seen in a while other than the straw weight season mainly because there was a belt on the line and a new division it was you know a lot of exciting contributing factors to it and um and so now you know you know, uh, if if it, this becomes a successful approach, I wouldn't mind seeing other teams versus other teams. You know what I mean? Um, like yeah, Alliance versus like Alliance versus AKA or something like that. That'd also be cool to me. They have their real coaches in there, which is cool. They're not going to be doing like the fighter coaches that come in. And um, I think some of the rivalry, I'm not entirely sure. I think the owner of the Black Zillions used to work at ATT and used to be a coach there, and he split from the gym. I'm not sure if that's entirely true. I am just, I'm thinking that's what it is, but I'm not sure. Backstabber. No, I'm just playing. I don't know if the, um, like, like I said, we don't know until we watch. But it should be interesting TV for me especially. I have another idea, though. If they were to do one, Alliance versus AKA, that would be a fun one, I think. Yeah, I don't know if there's any beef there, but yeah, that'd be fun. I don't think there needs to be beef, you know. No, I don't not... either, but I think it's a little bit more fun if there is. Well, true, but yeah, like I said, I just believe that you know there are top stars at a- AKA and there are top stars at Alliance, and not stars per se, but I'm I'm I mean like in in con- like you know very competitive fighters at both gyms that could make for an exciting season and show and you know introductions into the UFC, so. Yeah, and it seems like they have a lot of good guys coming out of both gyms, young up and comers. By the way, speaking of Alliance, let's give uh, Johnny Case uh, a shout out uh, for anybody that hasn't seen his uh, his piece on the Ultimate Insider uh, that's on both spot Fox Sports Two and Fox Sports One. Um, whenever it's available, check your DVRs and give that a look. Johnny Case did yeah. this uh, amazing piece on the Ultimate Insider that uh, definitely needs to be viewed. Nick, put your damn phone on silent. <laughs> what you can hear my phone? Oh, my it's bad. vibrating, yeah. Oh, my bad. <laughs> Not even paying attention to it. <clears throat> um, what else are we gonna talk about? I think that was it. Yeah, was it? I no, think we're going no, to 186 about now. Yes, uh, Wednesday morning though, Alistair Overeem finally called out Junior Dos Santos. That got me hyped. Alistair Overeem called out JDS. Hasn't he been doing that for years? I guess. I mean, it was the first time you've read a quote of him saying, yeah, I want that fight. Let's make that fight happen. That fight needs to happen. Uh, Junior is yeah. probably healthy by now, no? 
I would hope so. I'd hope so. If he's not, he needs to get that shit together. <laughs> his shit together. He gets injured after every fight, so at this point. Yeah, man, that's a bummer. Just... Another fight that was announced: Matt Brown versus Tim Means going down at UFC 189. Very big that's fight, a big for, Tim fight Means. for Tim Means. Yeah. Yeah, that's a huge fight, and Matt Brown and Tim Means is kind of like a like a you know, not not I wouldn't say he's as good as Matt Brown because I don't know yet. We need to see this fight first, but Means has a very similar style to Matt Brown. Probably not as intense, but uh and and uh you know, yeah, just I would say it's not as intense. But other than that, he emulates Matt Brown in a lot of ways. You know, as far as uh his aggressive style, his his Muay Thai on the on the feet, and his uh. And I actually would say he's probably got a more diversified ground game, though, than Brown on the ground. So. Oh, yeah. I mean, this guy just went from the prelims of uh, the fight uh, the Of the fight pass, pass, and he's now going to fight on a pay-per-view. It's pretty pass. crazy. Yep. Yeah. One of the biggest pay-per-views of, of the year. Is that going to be on the pay-per-view section, or is it going to be on the <clears throat> It looks like it will be. I'm looking at the lineup, and it has Matt Brown versus Tim Meads right under Robbie Lawler or McDonald. It even has it above Dennis Bermuda's Jeremy Stevens. Yeah, but if where are you looking at it from? Uh, MMA fighting. Yeah, so that's not. I mean, I don't know. Well, I mean, we'll see. We'll see where it happens. We'll yeah, because there's there's a lot of good fights in there because we also have on that card uh, Thatch for Brandon Thatcher versus John Howard, Gunnar Mike Nelson, Swick, John uh, yeah, Dwight. Mike Swick, Ella Garcia, Cody Gambrant versus uh, Henry Briones. No, I don't know Henry Briones. Yeah, the one guy I don't know. Dennis Bermuda's Jeremy Stevens. And of course, Lawler, McDonald, Aldo, McGregor. Yeah, we obviously know like the three fights are the definitely main card fights are the Bermuda, Stevens, Robbie, Lawler, McDonald, and Aldo McGregor. Yeah. Other than that, it's kind of a toss up. With I wouldn't be surprised to see Matt Brown on there though. You know, just because yeah, you know right. that's an exciting fight. Why not make that? I, I think they probably throw. Uh, if anything, that should be the prelims main event, like the the yeah. head of the prelims. I could see that, or I could see the. Thatch Howard fight as the main event of the prelims, or even the Nelson yeah. Hathaway fight. There's we'll see, man. I mean, this isn't. This is not. This is not a full card. There's still yeah, room no, for four more fights. Matches, so I'm yeah. sure they're gonna make another big match to throw on that pay per view. Yeah, I mean, there's still uh, there's still room for literally four more fights because each fight card yeah. fully is uh, is twelve to fourteen. Fourteen being more. There's never been more than fourteen, um, but generally they're twelve. So there's still t- four more minimum uh, fights that they need to make for this card. So you know. Hopefully they're good ones, which I can see them doing. I mean, this is a huge card. And uh, we talked about Phil Davis going to Bellator in the last one, right? Yeah, we did. Yeah. All right. Uh, one more fight that was announced. Husamar Paul, uh, Paul Harris versus Jake Shields will headline World Series of Fighting 22 August 1st um, in Las Vegas at – where will it be? <clears throat> Let me look. Hmm. I guess it doesn't say. It just says Las Vegas. How dare they? Not tell me which event or I mean which uh, venue. But it will happen in Vegas, um, August first, which is actually interesting. That's the same night as UFC 190, uh, Rousey versus uh, Correa. So yeah, I'm assuming they'll do it earlier in the day. Earlier, yeah. yeah, probably earlier in the day. It'll probably end midway through the UFC prelims or something like that. So. Yeah, they they're usually pretty smart about not competing with the UFC. Yeah. They will be competing with the UFC prelims. I mean, they did that last time. The, the yeah, they'll compete with the prelims, but then they're pretty smart about not looking to compete with the pay-per-views or the big Fox shows. Yeah, definitely. Plus, there's a card in Brazil. Not that that, you know, does anything to disbar the card. It could still be a very terrific card, I'm just saying, because it's in Brazil. I mean, I know that the time difference could also play a factor into why they decided to do it in Vegas. Yeah. So... <clears throat> But that's a great fight. Actually, that's one of the more interesting fights that the World Series of Fighting could make these days. And, um, I mean, who do you got in that one? To be honest with you, I believe Shields puts up a much better fight than anybody else uh, that's fought Paul Harris um, since he's left the UFC. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if this goes the distance. And I think we'll see some incredible scrambles. Paul Harris, once he's on the ground, he's like a little tap. You know, he's just going crazy looking for leg locks or submissions or anything. He's, he's, he's very... The, despite what many criticize about Paul Harris, he's never not exciting to watch. You know? Yeah, you can't really count him out of any fight just because of his, his leg locks are so ridiculous that, yeah. I mean, in the first round and the early going to the second round, he could beat anyone in this division just because that heel hook is so good. His knee bar, his every heel, leg lock he does, but especially that heel hook, 
it's ridiculous. So it's hard to pick either way because I think if it gets past midway through the second round, I think Shield is going to have his way with Paul Harris, especially in a five-round fight. Uh-huh. So I'm I'm leaning towards Jake Shields, but I wouldn't be surprised if he got leg locked in the early goings of that fight. I think if he does get submitted, it won't be in the first round. I think it'll be in the second or third round. I think if Shields can make it to the championship rounds, he has an advantage. He has experience there. Paul Harris is not. Yeah. Um, Jake Shields is pretty good cardio wise. Yeah, definitely. And you know, Paul Harris has not gone the distance very very many times. I mean, the last time I remember him going the distance was against Dan Miller. And that was years ago. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, and I don't think he has any uh, five-round fights on his record. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, certainly a five-round fight plays to Jake Shields' advantage. This is a very well-even fight. Uh, not saying something considering Paul Harris' uh, string of wins lately. Um, so, man, uh, exciting fight going down August 1st um, in Las Vegas. Uh, I'm very excited to see who wins that fight, definitely. I think that's it. Let's start talking about 186, yeah? Uh, yeah, let's go. Let's do it. Isling Daly versus Ronda Marcos, a fight I'm very looking forward to on this fight. Going down probably on the fight past prelims, it seems. Yep. Um, Isling Daly is one of the more aggressive straw weights that that division has. And Ronda Marcos, one of the um, unsuspecting stars that came from <laughs> the Ultimate Fighter. <laughs> what happened? What the hell was that? I don't know. <laughs> uh, Ronda Marcos, one of the unsuspecting stars coming from the Ultimate Fighter season twenty, was uh, you know, I'm very excited to see how she does coming into this division. Uh, it's about time we finally see her. Um, who do you got in this fight? I honestly want to pick uh, t- more towards Isling Daly, um, just because I feel like she'll use her size and and uh, advantages on the ground. Ronda is also uh, somewhat of a, a a ground fighter as well, so. You know, it could be very close, but I, I'm edging daily barely because of her size. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, Randa's I, – I asked Link's a little bit – well, a lot more experienced as she has 20 fights in her professional career. Randa only has six. And, uh, yeah, I'll agree with you because uh, I think Asling's pretty good on the ground while Randa showed some good things on the ground against Jessica Penne in the Ultimate Fighter finale. But – um. I think we could see Esling maybe get a submission here or take a decision. Uh, I don't know too much about either girl, so I wouldn't be too surprised to see it go either way, but I'm going to go with Esling. I would actually have Daly winning by TKO. I mean, Panay had her in many sorts of, in, uh, in a lot of trouble, but, you know, even Panay couldn't get it down and, or get a submission in. So I think that if Daly is smart, she'll more, she'll more actively look for the TKO finish than the submission. Um, in this fight, so I, I feel like maybe a late fight, late round submission, or, or the decision for Daly is what is my prediction. Um, and very surprisingly, um, this the return of Jessica Ricosi, the finalist from the Ultimate Fighter season twenty, uh, season eighteen, um, uh, finale, coming in finally, ma- uh, making her return. Uh, she was out not e- longer than uh, what's her name. Juliana Pena, which is yeah, surprising. Yeah, I don't know what happened to her. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, she was never injured. We just never talked about her after that. It's very, um, very odd. She's gonna Dude, be taking on weird. Valerie Latornio. I hope Dude, I said she's that. weird. I don't know why she has she has a one four record and made the finale of the Ultimate Fighter. That's yeah, so odd. I mean, that's very odd. <laughs> she has a loss to Felice Herrig. Oh, uh, Ricosi. Yeah, she yeah. fights at 135. I saw that fight. I remember when that fight yeah, happened. <laughs> and uh, But, you know, it's very interesting. We'll see what happens because uh, her opponent, Valerie Latorno, and I hope I said that right. Latorno. Latorno? Yeah. All right. Um, are you sure? Yeah. All right. <laughs> I don't know how to speak the, the Quebecian uh, French-ish name. Yeah, so. well, I've just heard it before. Huh? I don't either. I've just heard it before. Oh, gotcha. She's actually very experienced. Her opponent, uh, Valerie, who's fought Kaufman, Alexis Davis, Claudia Gadella, Roxanne Modafferi, which that's interesting. She's fought 135ers, 115-pounders, and 125-pounders. She's been all up and down the spectrum in her nine fights. Because yeah. uh, right right now, Roxanne is a 125-pounder. Claudia is a 115-pounder. 
and uh, Alexis Davis Kaufman are a 135 pounder. So that's very interesting. Very up and down the spectrum of divisions she's fought. Um, how big is she? She's actually fought, her very first fight was actually at 150 pounds. Oh shit! <laughs> but she's uh, now going to be at 135. I would believe that she's allowed her weight to really kind of uh, you know excel there at, at, at bantamweight. So we'll see how she does. Um, it's kind of a hard fight to call. We don't know what rakozi has been up to uh, in her time off and her absence. She's now 38 years old. Um, you know, so it's very, uh, I don't know. We'll see what happens for the former boxer. But uh, she certainly has the odds stacked against her. I believe if, if, if she loses this fight, it'll probably be it for her uh, UFC career. Yeah, that's most likely what's going to happen. And uh, looking at Letourneau's record, she seems to, she's beaten a lot of girls and then when you see the big names like Gadella she lost to by split decision which is kind of impressive even though she is fighting 20 pounds heavier she lost a split decision to Alexis Davis and uh, TKO to Kaufman but her win seems to come against a lot lesser known girls but I'll say this she is more experienced and I think I think she'll get the win over Rokosi well I'll stay. Uh, I'll stay safe away from this one. But if I had to pick a winner off the top of my head, I will go for the more experienced girl who has fought against the high competition before. Yeah. Regardless of win or loss, so we'll see what happens. Uh, but yeah, I gotta agree. I'll probably go with Valerie. But I will be re- rooting for Jessica. Um. So with that being said, we'll move on. Chris Clements going against Nordine Talib. Now, Chris Clements is very uh experienced. Um, as thus far in the UFC, already having taken on some some uh. Some good names, if I recall. Let's see, yeah, Stephen Thompson and Matt Riddle uh, fought. In, uh, you know, some very tough welterweights has also fought in his career. Jo- uh, John Alessio and Roy Markham and a lot of guys that have competed in the UFC, and he's actually won against a few of them. So, uh, Nordin Talib, I don't know too much about this guy. Do you know? Dude, I don't know what to make of him. He was on two seasons of The Ultimate Fighter and lost them both. Really? And then he'll like he has fights. He's two and zero in the UFC, but lost on two seasons of The Ultimate Fighter. He was in the house for the Australia versus Canada Ultimate Fighter. I think he lost in like his second fight. And then he went for the Ultimate Fighter season 19, I think. I don't know what season it was. And then wound up losing, I think, in the... I don't even think he made the house in that one. Damn. I think he got injured in Australia versus Canada. Dana gave him another shot on season 19. And then he just lost the first fight, so... And then he gets two fights in the UFC, wins them both. Are you sure really he didn't? Me. Are you sure he didn't win and got injured and then got another opportunity? That sounds like somebody that I remember. Um, I think he wound up losing a fight where he was injured, so they gave him another shot and on the American Ultimate Fighter. But the guy has two wins in the UFC, but hasn't been able to win an Ultimate Fighter. It's a little odd, but uh, yeah, I guess he doesn't do well in that format. And then Clements, I've seen him fight a few times. I don't know too much about him. I mean, I've seen him fight against guys like, uh, as you said, against Wonder Boy. They both have a, uh, they both have a winning common over Vic Grujic. Uh, Talib beat him back on the Bisping vs. Kennedy card by decision, and Clemens wound up beating him by a first round TKO. I'm not really sure what to make of this fight. I don't know too much about either guy. Um, I guess I'll go with uh, Talib by decision, but take that with a grain of salt because I don't really know all that much about either guy. Hmm. Next fight, we also have David Mitchell versus Olivier Aubin Mercier. Hopefully I said that right. Do you think I did? Aubin Mercier, I think. Oh, I was trying I'm to be fancy. not sure. It's another Quebec name. Yeah, I was trying to be fancy. <laughs> Um, it's a dope name. Olivier coming off of the uh, Ultimate Fighter losing to Chad Lepre, but then has uh, beat Jake Lindsay at the Safadine McDonald card last year. Um, I don't know. Uh, we'll just yeah, go through a kid, quick scrum of this. Kid. I honestly think Olivier will probably win um, based on his skill level that I've seen thus far. So with that being said, I think that he wins against David Machado. What do you got? Yeah, I have um, Aubin Marcier as well. I, I don't know, watching him on the Ultimate Fighter, he's legit. He has a, I think he's a legit grappler. He All of his wins have come by submission. 
He did have a little bit of trouble dealing with Chad Dupree on the feet, but he's he's decent on the feet, and he has a really good judo and jiu-jitsu game. So I'm going to go with uh, Mercier. I think he'll get a submission. Speaking of Chad Dupree, he's uh, also on this card right up after, and we'll be taking on um, Brian Barbarena. Barbarena, who just recently beat the brother of Jake Ellenberger, Joe Ellenberger. Um, big win. And so with that, you know, I mean, that's a big fight for both men here to see who uh, really breaks that threshold of mid-tier uh, with this with a win here, I think. So, you know, one's 9-0, and Chad Dupree and Brian Barbarena, 10-2, and two, very uh, two very skilled fighters. So that being said, I think this should be an interesting fight. Who you got? I think I'm going to go with uh, Chad Dupree uh, just because I believe his standing will be enough to hold uh, Barbarena at bay. Um, yeah. I think I'm going to agree with you again on this one. Um, Bob Reina looked good in the Ellenberger fight. He didn't look anything spectacular. He's fighting his hometown on short notice, though, so that's definitely impressive, but that's all I've seen. <coughs> that's all I've seen out of him. Yeah. Um, other than that, LaPree's standing has always looked really good. His takedown <sighs> defense is good, so I think I'll wind up going with LaPree on this one, too. Rematch time. Sarah Kaufman versus Alexis Davis in what will be a rematch, a rubber match, I guess you could say, though Sarah Kaufman has beaten Alexis Davis twice uh, throughout her career, very early on in 2007, and then again in what year was that? Um, 2012, three years later since. They will now fight for the, they will now fight, I believe this is the prelim headliner, correct? Um, no, no, it's not. No, it's not. It's, uh, okay, yeah, so Alexis Davis, Sarah Kaufman, third fight. Alexis Davis has come a long way since. Uh, Davis is coming off, I believe, a victory over who? Uh, Alexis Davis, his most recent fight was the Lost Around. Oh, Lost Around. Man, I just didn't believe that that was really the last fight. Okay. Um, and then Kaufman also coming off a hefty layoff, I believe. Um, hasn't, hadn't fought since she beat Leslie Smith. Yeah, it's been a while, huh? It's been a year. Wow. A year. It doesn't feel like it, but yeah, yeah, it's been a long time. Why? I wonder why. That's awkward. I don't know. But, you know, Sarah Kaufman uh, and Alexis Davis have some beef. Let's see what happens. I honestly can't see Kaufman losing this fight. Her striking is still as dangerous as it ever is, and Alexis Davis is still very, uh, um, still not the best in that category. So, that being said, I think Kaufman is able to fight off any takedowns that Alexis throws her way, and Kaufman shoves them off, keeps it standing, and wins where she's comfortable. Gets probably the decision here with uh, with another uh, dominating victory over Alexis Davis. Yeah, and their last fight wound up being a majority decision. I see this being scrapped, but uh, I think Kaufman's good enough to defend the takedowns. At least uh, she'll be able to defend the takedowns of Alexis Davis, as Davis isn't really the strongest top game in her jiu-jitsu. She does have good jiu-jitsu, but her top game isn't anything special. And she, her takedowns, she's never really been the most aggressive person shooting takedowns. And then uh, Kaufman is going to get the best of her on the feet, as you said. So I'll go with Kaufman by decision. I will say the most impressive win on Alexis Davis's record right now is Amanda Nunez, who she beat in Strike Force four years back. But yeah. Amanda Nunez that, at that time was only 21 years old. So... Yeah, she made a lot of improvements since then. Very. Um, with that being said, yep, we're going to go with Sarah Kaufman. We'll move on to the next fight. The headliner of the prelims, Joe Diesel. Riggs taking on Patrick the Predator Cote. Uh, I actually like this fight. I think it makes a lot of sense right now for where both guys are at. Um, uh, for me, honestly, I got to go with Cote. I think his striking is way up to par with Joe Riggs. I think he's also going to be able to utilize a. Uh, um, some technique in the striking as well. Joe Riggs tends to be kind of a powerhouse and doesn't um, generally set up combinations as well as he should. He's more of a, you know, look for one-twos and hit with power kind of guy. So uh, I think Cote will be able to catch him. And uh, I really would be surprised if this did if this went to the judges, to be honest with you. So with that, I, I think I'm going to go with Cote here, winning in his uh, home country. This is a really uh, – we had – Joe Riggs, 40 years old. We had a, We saw him in his last fight in such a weird loss. He got a neck injury against Ben Saunders, and it mm -hmm. didn't look that bad at the time. And then, I don't know, it was very weird. It only came in less than a minute in that fight. So it must not have been that bad. That fight was only four months ago. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm not entirely sure how that affected him or if it did at all after the fight, fact of the fight. 
But, um, yeah, I will wind up going with Cote here as well. I think he's had a lot more competition in recent history. He's beating guys like Kyle Noak, Bobby Volker, Sakara, And his only losses from the left since 2011 have been against Kung Lee and Steven Thompson, two really high-level strikers. So I think that he will get the win over Joe Riggs. Agreed. We'll move on to the next fight. Thomas Taminas uh, Almeida, I hope I said that right, versus Eve, the Tiger, your Wayne, uh, bantamweight fight. Uh, I've always been a big fan of Eve Wayne, so um, I'm going to let my bias take me. But Thomas Almeida is 15-0. That's very impressive, no matter how you slice it. So um, I don't know. Let me look at his wins. Hmm, nobody that I recognize other than Cody Williams. Oh. And Sam uh, Lima, I recognize both of those guys from Access TV. He um, has a win over Tim Gorman, that kid who got hurt on the Ultimate Fighter that day in the city to give a shot to in the UFC. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I, I that. don't know, don't know anyone else on his record at the top of it though. Yeah, I recognize a few off of the Access TV fights that I watch. Um, other than that, you know, Eve Wayne has been there with much tougher competition. He is a little up there though. He's 35 years old now. Um. So, you know, with that being said, he also hasn't fought in a, in nearly a year, last beating Mike Easton and signing him his walking papers. Uh, but, uh, you know, as we've said, he's also taken on Eddie Wineland and uh, Brad Pickett and Mark Hominick, he's, uh, Rafael Sunsau. He's been in there with some big names and, you know, uh, former WEC guy as well. He's been in there a while, but we'll, we'll see if Almeida can be able to take advantage of that. He's 23. He's a young dude. For 15 and all, that's impressive. He's finished – uh, almost all of his fights. I think he's only got. I think his only decision was uh, the Tim Gorman uh, victory. Looking at his record, yeah, that was the only yeah. decision. So according I mean, to we'll, Sherdog, he's actually seventeen and zero. Oh, I'm looking at his uh, um, underdog or underdog <laughs> underground page. So <clears throat> maybe if he's seventeen and zero, um, what were his first two fights then? Um, it says Danilio Molina, oh. Oh, first round long bar, and Jorge Fernando, first round long bar. Yeah, Jorge Fernando uh, is missing, uh, though De- Danilio Molina is in there, so there might just be another fight missing from here. So Yeah. I'll go sure dog then, 17-0, still impressive. Uh, yeah, 23 years old, that's a lot of fights. This is a tough one to call then, because uh, it's a young stud with a impressive record versus uh, an old experienced veteran in Yves Um I think I'm going to go with the young gun here. I mean, uh, they've been making a lot of upsets lately, and so with that, I'm going to go with that. I'm going to go with Almeida getting the upset. Yeah, it does seem like the young guys have been winning a lot over these veterans, but uh, they both have a lot of experience fighting-wise, but I think Jabouin has a lot more experience against higher-level guys. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, I think, that's, I think I'm going to take him for that reason. I think he has more experience against tougher guys, and... He looked great in that fight against Mike Easton, even though it was almost a year ago. So, yeah, I'll go with him by decision. Dear God, are we disagreeing on a fight? Oh, wow. Oh, my God. (laughs) Shane Campbell taking on John McDessie. Now, this fight was originally supposed to be Abel Trujillo versus John McDessie, which is a very interesting fight. Yeah. Not going to happen, but props to Shane Campbell for taking the fight on such short notice. 9-2 has won over half his fights. Um that being said, I gotta say I am uh, interested in seeing how he does. Uh, I remember he was there was I remember reading an article on Shane Campbell, uh, being one of the guys to look forward to in the uh, uh, who will get signed by the UFC soon. Sure enough, he did. Um, has a good streak going on, um, where he's uh, finished his last three fights. So yeah, I don't really know too much about Shane Campbell, but um. Same. Wasn't uh, McDess he hasn't fought since February of last year, and that was that uh, Alan Patrick fight that I'm pretty sure was like one of the most oddly scored fights of all time. Uh, I believe so. I'm not sure. I, I don't remember. Like I, I'd have like to watch it again to remember. It looked how it was like McDessie won that fight, and then it was like, it was very oddly scored. I don't remember. Exactly I'm seeing right here was. that the fight was scored 30-27 for Alon, 29-28 for the other two judges for Alon. Ricardo yeah. Almeida was actually one of the three judges of that card. I see. Uh, I remember there was being a weird fight that, I, yeah, I'm looking on MMA Decisions right now, which basically is a bunch of media scores, 
And every single member of the media that scored that fight scored it for McDessey, aside from Sean Alshadi from MMA Fighting, who scored it a draw. Not one person scored it for Patrick. Damn. Yeah. So All right. I, that kind of makes me want to watch that fight now, but then I'll probably just get mad. <laughs> yeah. Very, very controversial. You kind of got you got you got lower on the volume. Can you get loud again, please? <laughs> Wait, what's the matter? You you got quieter, like uh. I guess if you like shied away from your mic or something. No. No. Oh, okay, you're loud again. Never mind. Um, <clears throat> That's really weird. <laughs> I don't know. With that, I mean, McDessey hasn't been in there for a while. Shane Campbell has been there much more recently. Um, I don't know. We'll see. Uh, he fought recently, competed uh, for the World Series of Fighting, so getting a victory against Derek Boy. Actually, I remember that fight. I remember that he got an elbow cut, and then uh, he got like an elbow, which caused a huge gash. At the beginning of the third round, and then just went for punches like a madman and got the victory right after. So I mean, he's a very aggressive fighter. Now that I remember that fight, um, hmm. So it should be still interesting. Both guys are very aggressive. Uh, McDessey, especially, he's very sly. Uh, I'll never forget that victory over uh, Spencer Fisher. I believe it was, um, or no, 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 was it Spencer Fisher? Who was it? Uh, who was it? Or... Kyle Watson? No. It was Kyle Watson. Kyle Watson, he did this insane spinning back fist that landed so flush on the dude's chin that he just mannequined up and he f fell down and stiff as all hell. It was one of my uh, favorite Kyle, knockouts. Kyle Watson? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah that was an incredible knockout. Uh, spinning back fist, one of the most highlighted knockouts that you'll ever see. If you want to see it, UFC 129, spinning back fist, Kyle Watson, John McDessie. It was amazing. Um, yeah. With that being said, you know, I mean, Shane, Shane Campbell, uh, a young stud who uh, could certainly get it done. I mean, McDessie's not too old. He's only 30. Um, this, this should be a very good fight. I actually, now that we're breaking it down, I really actually am excited for this fight uh, coming up. So, hmm, very close to call. I've already called one upset, so I'm going to stick with McDessie here. I think he, he's able to go in there, especially uh, considering he's uh, split his time at TriStar for this fight, according to an interview he did earlier. Um, so with that being said, i, I got to go with John McDessie. I'm going to go with him. Yeah, looks like we're agreeing again. I don't really know anything about Shane Campbell, and McDessie has impressed me in his striking throughout. He's beating guys like Stan Stout, Darren Crookshank. I think he has a much better resume for obvious reasons than Shane Campbell does. Well, obviously, we've seen a lot of upsets recently, but I'm going to go with McDessey. Shane Campbell is six feet tall, too, and John McDessey is 5'8". <laughs> so he's four inches taller. That should be interesting. We finally move on to the premier three of this somewhat of a triple header card. Um, C.B. Dalloway, the Doberman, taking on Michael the Count Bisping. Both guys in need of a win coming off loss. Uh, Michael more so has come off two losses. One to, I believe, Tim Kennedy and then the other to Luke Rockhold. Correct? Am I right? Oh, no. He beat Kung Lee in between those. So he's interval in between win and losses in his last six fights. So he's 3-3 three and three in his last three. Um, actually, he's 4-4 four and four in his last eight. <laughs> um, so that being said, I mean, it should be interesting. Huh? Did you say something? No. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, I actually feel that this is a much closer fight than it looks. Um, I don't know. I think if Michael loses this fight, though, it's such an important fight for him. I think if he loses this, I think any title hopes... I think he's strictly gatekeeper if he loses this fight. Yeah. I mean, I don't think he has too much title hopes and aspirations at this point just because he's been back and forth on wins and losses recently i mean he lost to luke rockwell he seems like he the furthest he'll get back to and especially now he's out of his prime he's a little bit older now he's 36 the furthest he'll get is maybe top five at this point he has a loss to rockhold kennedy and that kennedy fight really showed a lot he had a lot of trouble defending kennedy's takedown but i think He'll be able to defend Dalloway's takedown. Bisping is really hard to get to the ground and to keep there. I think he'll pick him apart on the feet, and I'm going to go with Bisping. Um, I don't know if he'll get the finish there, but um, I, yeah, I'll go with Bisping by, I'll call it TKO round two. 
I don't think Bisping gets a finish here. I will agree with you on Bisping getting the win, but I actually think that if this fight goes one of two ways, Bisping wins by decision or CB Dalloway gets a finish. Uh, it's very hard for me to call any other way. Um, CB Dalloway has got some heavy uh, punches, and uh, I believe anybody from Power MMA that includes Bader or uh, you know anybody else that's been over there thus far training in Arizona, I gotta I gotta say CB Dalloway seems to have made the most improvement with his hands. Um, so I think his striking gives uh, Bisping a run for his money, but I think Bisping will be able to land more punches and outscore him with his uh, outstanding cardio. And uh, and he'll be able to get the decision, or CB catches him uh, and gets the finish. One of those two things is going to happen. I think the more likely thing to happen is probably Michael Bisping. So that will be my final answer there for that. Yeah, fight. I get why I get why you're saying that uh, CB is more likely to land that one punch knockout. But again, I I think that's a little a little odd. I mean, I I could see your point of saying that he has more power in his punches, but Bisping is. Obviously, the more technical striker is cardio. Obviously, plays a huge role into the way he's able to fight. But Bisping is a guy who rarely gets finished, especially knocked out. His only knockout that I can really remember outside of Dan Henderson is to Vitor, which was TRT'd up Vitor two years ago. And I think, yeah, I think those are his only two losses by knockout. So I don't think it's very likely that Bisping gets finished in this fight. Okay. <laughs> I well, I mean, I, I, the guy doesn't get knocked out. I don't think it's very likely well, that he gets he knocked out get by Gallagher Dalloway because a wrestler that's, first. That's yeah, because yeah, he yeah. doesn't get oh. hit very often, you know? I mean, he rarely yeah. gets hit. Um, and he is a tough dude, for sure, especially when guys do get him on the ground like Tim Kennedy. He, he did land a lot of good shots. He got on the mount quite often. And uh, even then, Tim couldn't finish him, so. Yeah, we've seen Dalloway. Dalloway's made a pretty impressive run, but his last three losses have all been by knockout or TKO. So I think he's the one who's more likely to get finished by Bisping. Who was the last guy besides Machida to knock the CB out? Uh, Jared Haman was in 2011, and then Munoz was 2011 too. But he went on a run from there, and he lost that decision to Boach that I, I thought he won. So, oh, yeah, right. he's been on a big run aside from that Machida loss. We'll see. Uh, yeah. Yeah, like I said, I, I, I wasn't, you know, I said that Bisping getting the decision win was more likely. Uh, I don't believe that, you know, oh, geez, sorry. Tired? <laughs> A little bit. I don't believe that um, Bisping will finish him only because I think that he'll, he'll, he'll be not as, what's the word? I'm trying to think of the word right now. Brain fart. Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, I could definitely see it going to decision and Bisping getting the win that way, but I think just Bisping's constant pressure and throwing all those punches, I think he has a shot at finishing Dalloway, but I really wouldn't be surprised to see it go to decision either. Actually, that's the thing, is that I feel like he'll be more tentative in this fight, more so because he's he knows he needs a victory here. I think, not that he'll be playing it safe, but, you know, I think he'll be more cautious in this fight than, than anything. Okay. Uh, in, in recent, that's fair. Yeah. So I think that that's why it'll go to decision. I think he'll do what's necessary to win each round um, more so than look for the finish. I'm sure if the finish presents itself, he'd go for it. But I don't think that it'll present itself as often as he would like for it to, that he'd be able to take advantage of it and get the finish. So with that, I got Michael Bisping. If you understand what I'm saying now. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I mean, I, I got your point the entire time. Dope. All right, so we'll move on to the co-main event, which was restored just recently on Tuesday. Quentin Rampage Jackson. Now, fight fans, this will be a catchweight fight. It'll be at 215 pounds for obvious reasons. Jackson taking the fight on obviously short notice, considering the fact that he didn't think he was going to fight, um, will now be taking this 215 catchweight, which is fair. Um, uh, this is going to be a tough one to call because, you know, Fabio thus far has won four straight at um, light heavyweight. But they haven't been guys that possess the power or knockout prowess or striking prowess, I should say, um, of Rampage Jackson. So it should it, it should be a very competitive fight. I, I know if anybody knows Rampage these days, he loves to just stand and trade with guys. And Fabio Maldonado is certainly one of the guys that's more than willing to do that with him. So I think it should be a very exciting fight. I think we should expect to finish. Uh, and for me, I'm going to go with Rampage. I think that, you know, the, the fact that he's reinvigorated his career over at Bellator and gotten some finishes lately. And, um, you know, I, I would like to think that he's taking this fight more than seriously. 
Um, I would uh, hope that, you know, all the legal troubles haven't distracted him from training and being able to keep in shape. And so with that, I'm going to go with uh, Rampage, third round knockout. Yeah, I agree with you again. I think Rampage is going to win. He'll probably get a knockout in this one. And we've seen, I mean, Maldonado does have good striking, but the guys he's been able to beat have been more so just guys that are a bit lower names, guys that you might not have heard of or guys who are just aren't like those big name guys. And when he's gotten in there with guys like Steve Miocic, who's a heavyweight, obviously lost by TKO in 35 seconds. We saw him against Glover. He got a doctor stoppage after getting beat up in that fight, even though he did catch Glover once. So um, I think another big striker like Rampage who could throw heavy, even though Maldonado might be the more technical striker in this one, I think he's going to wind up getting caught somewhere around two or three. Same. I don't think that he puts uh, Rampage down. It takes a lot to really do that. Um, so with that being said, yeah, Rampage. I mean, Fabio is going to have to really land a powerhouse knockout to, to really put him on his ass. So should be interesting. I, th- I, yeah, I, don't, I don't see, no matter what, I don't see this going to the judges. If it does, it'd be because one of them has been too tentative. I only see it not being going to the judges because I, see, I feel that both guys will be more than uh, amply ready to get in the middle and trade. Um, if they were to be, if someone was to be smart, then like say Maldonado, uh, I would definitely want to utilize the longer reach, which I believe Maldonado has, and and be technical in the sense that you you counter whenever Rampage goes crazy and comes forward, starts swinging wild. Um, not that Rampage always does that. His hooks are very, uh, his hooks have very technical, you know, they have some technical aspects to them, but. You know, sometimes he abandons that technique and just swings wildly at times. With that being said, I believe that uh, Jackson will also be smart in this fight, knowing that he needs to be able to look for the finish instead of just swing wildly and hope it comes to him. You know what I mean? Yeah, I get what you're saying. I think Rampage should be able to win this fight regardless. Maldonado, I don't even think, will really look for the takedown as that's not his forte, and I don't think he'll be able to get it if he did. So I think Rampage has the advantage in this one. Moving on to the main event of the evening for the UFC flyweight title. Headlining, Demetrius Johnson, Mighty Mouse, taking on Kyoji Horiguchi. I love that name, by the way. Kyoji <laughs> Horiguchi. Yeah. <laughs> Yoji Horiguchi. If you say it like I say it, it's fun. You feel like a, a, a supervillain in an anime show. <laughs> <laughs> Kyoji Horiguchi has won four straight? Four or five? Four? Uh, let me take a look. Kyoji Horiguchi. I believe it's four. He's beaten like guys like Wilson Hayes and Luis Gadno and four. Uh, in the UFC, you're talking, right? Yeah, four straight. I know he's won like nine straight, but in the UFC, he's won like four, right? Four, yeah. Dustin Pig, Daryl Montague, John De Los Reyes, and Luis Gadno. Luis Gadno. Uh, wait a minute. John De Los. Wait, isn't that Hills? Isn't that Wilson Hayes? No. <gasps> who was that? Who was that? Beat, who was that that beat Wilson Hayes recently? Then I don't know. Um, I don't know. I don't think that's really on subject right now. But... <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to remember. But yeah, I, I, mean, I will so... say this: in every fight that Kyoji won, he did look way better than every bit of competition. Any fight that did go to the decision, he won all three rounds. And the other two fights, Dustin Pig and uh, John Delos uh, Reyes, he finished handedly. Convincingly, but he is about to face one of the pound for pound best fighters in the world. Um, he's very fast, but not as fast as Demetrius. And uh, we haven't seen enough of his grappling game to know if he can stop the takedowns of Demetrius. And let's be real, Demetrius probably has the best takedowns um, and the best level change in the flyweight division. With that being said, I got to say that Demetrius will probably take full advantage of his of, of his uh, ability to, to you know change levels and be unpredictable and get the takedown and basically dictate the pace of this fight throughout all 25 minutes. Um, I actually see Demetrius Johnson getting it to the ground, finding a rear naked choke in the third round. That's my prediction. What do you got? Um, yeah, another grill here between us. Uh, <laughs> Horiguchi's a young guy. He's only 24, and at this point, there's so few contenders at flyweight. Horiguchi didn't even think he was ready for a title fight, but with the the whole Lineker situation, he had no choice, really. They gave it to him. He took it. Obviously, you're going to take the title fight. There aren't really any other contenders. 
he, he, he's really impressive. I mean, he's a really good fighter. It's just that DJ is so much better than everyone in that division in every aspect of fighting. So I think DJ will look really good in this fight. He's been finishing a lot of fights lately. I mean, he a lot of people used to think he was just a decision machine. Now the guy's just been finishing guys. He finished uh, Cariasso in his last fight. He finished uh, Benavidez by a straight up knockout. So and he had a armbar over Moraga. So um, I don't know if Horiguchi will be able to get to the uh, judges' scorecards. I think uh, DJ will probably finish this one by decision. Yeah, I mean, not decision, a submission. Let me see. Thus far in the UFC, one, two, three, four, five, six decisions, one, two, three, four, six decisions, and four finishes. It's not bad. For DJ, yeah, and I mean... Yeah. And especially he, a lot considering of his, his competition, yeah. His submission, his finishes have come recently. He's finished three of his last four fights. Yeah, against uh, Cariaso, Moraga, and Benavidez, especially the Benavidez one is my favorite flyweight knockout. Um, uh, so uh, other than uh, most recently the the guy uh, Freddie, uh, Freddie, uh, Freddie, Freddie, Freddie Nanez, uh, the Brazilian guy who got that insane wicked uppercut at the last Brazilian event. The oh yeah, I know who you're talking about. Yeah. I just don't know his name. Those, it's between those two for my favorite knockouts in flyweight history. Um, yeah. This would be an awesome fight. I can't wait to see it. I, I mean, I love watching Demetrius go to work, which is why I have been excited for this card, regardless of, of the injury plague that it's been littered with. Um, but with that being said, oh, also, you had found out some news about Rampage Jackson that we needed to talk about. Go ahead and uh, read that thing out from MMA Junkie that we had read earlier, the article. Um. Yeah, let me just get the page loaded up, and I'll read away. I mean, it was – apparently the judge said – Bellator didn't prove irreparable harm in the Rampage fighting at UFC 186. So it looks like Rampage will be fighting at UFC 186, but the lawsuit against him for, again with Bellator will be ongoing. So it's possible that he won. He's not after 186. He won't be able to fight until everything's cleared up. So um, Fair enough. the quote from MMA Junkie is, what this all means, the lawsuit between Bellator and Jackson is ongoing. Uh, the injunction keeps Jackson from fighting at UFC 186 has been set aside, and Jackson currently remains under a general preliminary injunction from fighting for any MMA promoter, with the exception of UFC 186. Um, from there, it says, It is apparent to the court that the injunction of the merits of the parties' respective claims and defenses will require uh, factual determination. Unless there is a settlement between the parties, the court will need to rule whether Jackson was in breach of contract or not. And if the court later finds Jackson was in breach with Bellator, Bellator can be awarded damages for him competing at UFC 186. There are still a lot of legal battles before this case is put to rest. Well, that means Bellator is going to let the UFC play their hand in having Jackson compete for them, but it, it um, it's a gamble for Jackson considering if he loses this... Uh, this hearing or the, this court um oh wow okay but let me finish um th that means that you know if jackson should lose this uh lose his day in court with bellator then he will have to pay some damages off to bellator and that doesn't e and that doesn't even really point to whether or not jackson would have to still compete for bellator and finish out his contract or if based on the court um based on whatever happens in court he would be able to just be released from his contract altogether yeah, I would assume that he would still have to fight for Bellator if Bellator were to win that. And I'm not sure if he would have to pay Bellator or if the UFC would. I'm not entirely sure. Maybe both. I don't know. The Yeah, I mean, uh, we'll, we'll see what happens. I mean, right now, thus far, everything is hearsay. So um, until, the, until we find out what's going on in court, which we will, of course, uh, talk about when that day comes. Till now, until then, he's going to get his day to fight and get paid this weekend. So... Enjoy it while you can, because it might be the only time we see him in the UFC if Bellator wins. If not, then good for them, and they probably get a they probably get Rampage back for the rest of his career. In which case, it's just a matter of uh, it's just a matter of the weight game right now. Um, one last thing that we got to talk about that was just announced: uh, Matt Dwyer versus uh, Alan Jabwayne just got announced, which is a great fight in my opinion. I'm a big fan of Alan 
Joe Wayne, who recently fought at UFC 184. I got to see that live, had that crazy comeback knockout in the first round. And uh, Matt Dwyer, <clears throat> where have I heard of that name? Look it up. I know I've seen him fight before. Oh, yes. I remember now. He fought recently on the uh, Mir Silva card. Got that knockout against William Macario. That Superman punch, remember? Oh, yeah. So the guy who got the crazy elbow knockout against the uh, Australian um, in his last fight uh, will be taking on the Superman punch uh, knockout machine uh, in Matt Dwyer. So, and that's going to happen at UFC Fight Night 71, headlined by Todd Duffy and Frank Mir. So it's going to be on uh, Fight Night uh, 1. Can't wait to see it. I'm excited for that. I'm a huge Alan Jaboy fan. What do you think of that fight? Yeah, me too. I really enjoy watching uh, Alan fight. He's been really impressive, and uh, I think he's a big. He could be a big star in the sport. I really do. I think he has the. I think he has the style of and the, the look, and he's a good personality to be a star in the in MMA. He looks like Cristiano Ronaldo, so that doesn't hurt at all. <laughs> but um, yeah, and we also. Uh, just had another big fight announced. Apparently, uh, UFC on Fox 16 just got another big fight to it. Uh, Danny Castillo versus uh, Rustam Kabalov. Woo! That's a good one. I like that. Yeah, that's a pretty good card so far, UFC on Fox 16. Definitely. We've covered a lot of bases today. There's been a lot of news I've been hitting since we last talked on uh, Sunday. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's just there's been a lot of fights made in the last hour. Yeah. Awesome. Fight fans. UFC 186 going down. Fight, uh, fight, uh, blah. The prelims, of course, will be on at 5 p.m. Pacific time, 8 p.m. Eastern time on Fox Sports 1. Pay per view going down at 7 o'clock uh, Pacific, 10 o'clock Eastern. Uh, exciting card. Please watch it. You're not going to regret it. I believe this card will be great, um, despite what Chris Pac Man says. Um, <laughs> no, I think it could be exciting. I just don't think it's high level of MMA, at least for the most part. I disagree. I disagree with you a lot. I actually think that Shane Campbell, Almeida have the, the chance to really shine and show that they are high level fighters. And, um, They're not pay per view level fighters at this point. Maybe it's early to have them on pay per view. I agree. At this point. At this point, yeah, it's probably point. a little early to put them on pay per view. I agree. With it's that. a lot early. <laughs> <laughs> it is. You dirty whore. All right. Anyway, yeah, this guy I've never heard of fighting on the pay per view. Come on. It's a, It's a, maybe you're just ignorant. I've heard of him. Shane Campbell, yeah, you've heard of him. I've but watched him fight. fight. I saw his yeah, last fight. Yeah, watched him fight once at World Series of Fighting. The guy hasn't even fought for the UFC yet, and he's fighting on a pay per view main well, that's card. That's because, well, that's, and he's not that's a big due star. to injuries. He's not a big star. I know but, it's due to in injuries, but that still has a lot to do with how good the card is. But that's it's but that's a I but that's attributed to be because very, of the injuries. I think it would be very easy for them to throw Alexis Davis or Kaufman on the main card and take that fight and put it on the prelims. I agree with that. I think that you know because especially because they're ranked fighters and uh, you know it, it's still card, the card would look a lot better if they did something like that. I agree. I think that they keep them on the prelims just because they want to also up the uh, viewership on the prelims as best they can. Um, all right, I think we're. I think that's all we got. Yeah. I have some fake, uh, some fan questions, but they can wait till the next episode. It's been a minute. All right, no worries. Yeah, and uh, now that we're done with that, we're actually going to introduce your buddy. What's his name? Uh, yeah, uh, Extreme Cage Fighting President. Uh, he's an amateur promoter out here in New York. Uh, Christian DeFiris will be joining us shortly. Shortly. Just give us a few minutes. And uh, in the meantime, again, just look over the card. It's great. Rampage, Michael Bisping, Demetrius Johnson, especially. I think that, you know, uh, again, listening to his quotes should definitely be, be heard and um, – we're about to. What's his name again? I'm sorry. Wait, what? Your your promoter friend? Christian DeFiris. Okay, I was just looking at his thing. <laughs> you just went way off track. Yeah, my bad. But uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, if you, if there is a reason to watch this card, it is Demetrius Johnson. He is one of the best fighters in the world, despite the fact that, of course, the division he fights in may seem shallow. I don't think that it is. I think that it's filled with some very competitive fighters. Kyoji Horiguchi himself is that was one of those fighters. Um, Demetrius is so well above and beyond. He's basically the Ronda Rousey of his division in that people want to say that that division is also shallow, and it's not. The The division is very packed and you know uh, filled with uh, credible fighters. 
And, uh, you know, of course, there are two really exciting ones going on next month. John Dodson versus uh, Makovsky and Benavidez versus Moraga. Um, three of which uh, Demetrius has beaten. And yet people know that those are two exciting flyweight fights to watch. And so um, we'll see what happens. I honestly believe that John Dodson, should he win, will probably get the next title shot against whoever wins this fight. So, um and with that, we're going to go ahead and close this bitch out. With that, we're going next week, Monday, episode 37 of the MMA Discussion Podcast, a packed episode. Benil Darius, UFC lightweight, who just recently got a victory over Jim Miller at UFC on Fox 15 last this past Saturday, will be joining us. Um, very excited. That's a huge guest to have. We're also going to be joined by um, your buddy, uh, XFC. Uh, yeah, we're going to be joined by uh, Extreme Cage Fighting President Christian DeBeers. He runs an amateur promotion out here in New York. And when I spoke to him last year, he was thinking about getting into the pro game. So with New York looking on the up and up, coming professional legalization of professional MMA here, we'll talk to him about that too. It'll be a fun episode. Definitely. Can't wait. A packed episode. You definitely want to get to it. Again, we're here on Facebook, on our MMA discussion page, we're on YouTube, iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud. Give us a rating, a, re a review. We're also on uh, sportsofanarchy.com, which could also be getting some very big changes uh, coming forward. Um, we may or may not be switching it to mmadiscussion.com. I really want to. That's a, <laughs> like a, an awesome idea. That's the plan. That's, That's the plan, plan right now. And so, um, you know, it's going to be uh, – we got a lot of things coming up, but we also want to thank Sal Almeida for his appearance on this episode. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty bummed I missed that interview. Yeah, that was Next time. Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, dude is the man. We appreciate his time. Uh Good luck to him and what wishes on him getting the uh, UFC contract he's been after. Um, great stuff from him. And, yeah, we can't wait to, yeah, to have him again when his next fight – yeah, can't wait to have him on again when his next fight is signed. Uh, with that, if you want to hit me up on Twitter, I'm at Nick the Phantom on Twitter. Uh, Chris Pagliuca's Twitter handle is at Chris, P-A-G-L-I-U-C-A. -A. Um, you can also hit us up at Sports of Anarchy to, um, on Twitter. Uh, please check us out. Also, in the next week, we're going to be putting, we're going to start updating our rankings again. Um, yeah, and check them out because I honestly believe the UFC rankings are, are ridiculous. Yeah, so. they're pretty out there. Some of these rankings. <laughs> uh, we'll definitely have some good rankings for you guys. And um, we're looking, we're definitely looking to make the page Sports of Anarchy, which you're looking to make it into MMA discussion, have an MMA discussion Twitter. It's just to put everything into one. It'll be focused around the podcast. We'll have MMA articles, review news, features, interviews, whatever. It'll be on there. It'll be on the Facebook page. And uh, make sure to rate and review and subscribe to the podcast on whatever, YouTube, Stitcher, SoundCloud, iTunes. We just want to hear your feedback, what we're doing well, what you guys think we can Everything else, we really do appreciate it. Awesome. We appreciate you guys. Thank you. Have a great one. Get episode 37, uh, Planet. That's going to be an awesome one. Benil Darush, we're excited to have him on. Sal Almeida, thank you again for coming on. With that, have a good rest of the week, ladies and gentlemen. Enjoy the fights Later. this weekend. Later.